church. <laughs> it's good to be here to worship God. Um, wanted to share with you this morning, my heart was full of joy. Uh, we've had bluebirds nesting in our yard since April, and we saw the little ones peeking their head out, getting at the edge of the nesting box, and missed it. They still haven't left. I don't know how many are in there, either maybe three or four, whatever, but I just God just knows, he knows how to thrill me, <laughs> you know. Just let me see this little speck of little bluebird. And it's trying, and it's parents are coaxing him, talking to him, and it's like, not getting out yet. So, but there's a time for them to leave, and if they leave too early, it could mean not too good for the baby. So, you know, they, the parents know, and just how good God is to, for these little birds and the joy they give. But I wanted to share with you Psalm 136, Love by God. Psalm 136, in that psalm, if you happen to look it up, um, it's repeated this phrase 26 times. His love endures forever. I'm going to break it up. I had read a devotional on Friday about this, and it just spoke to my heart, so I wanted to share with you. The, um, his love endures forever. We're going to look at one part of the, the psalm about God being the creator, and that goes along with my bluebird family. God is our redeemer. We're here to worship Jesus. He's our redeemer that uh, they spoke um, in the Old Testament about Israel leaving Egypt, but Jesus, he is our redeemer. And then the last part, God is our provider. So we can take those three things and just take that with us today, how much God loves us and what his word promises us. So this 26 times to repeat, his love endures forever. And what it would be is that, like we have sometimes our responsive reading, they sang this hymn, this psalm. And they would sing it, the worship leader, and then the people, the congregation would say the phrase, his love endures forever. But that word love, they, in my reading, the devotional, talked about it's more use more than just love, it's about commitment and faithfulness of God. The commitment and God's commitment and faithfulness to us. So um, we're going to look at the psalm and to know that this line repeats, his love endures forever, means that God will not give up on us. He won't give up on us. His love endures forever. So it comes and repeats that over and over. He won't give up on his people. He won't give up on his children. We are so special to him. God's unfailing love is celebrated through his amazing works. And sometimes we need to be reminded what God has done. So the first part, we're going to look at verses 5 through 9. God is the creator. He made the sun, the moon, and the stars. And in verse 5, who by his understanding made the heavens. His love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters? His love endures forever. Who made the great lights? His love endured forever. The sun to govern the day? His love endures forever. The moon and the stars to govern the night? His love endures forever. When we gaze at the night sky, we're humbled by just the beauty of it all and the power in our universe. But for God, he just made everything and he did it for his own purpose. He made us, created us. He did the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars. It's who he is, our creator. So this hymn reminds Israel that God is there for them. God is our redeemer, and this psalm also celebrates God's deliverance of Israel from the bondage, and this is in verses 10 through 15. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, his love endures forever, and brought Israel out from among them, his love endures forever. With a mighty hand in an outstretched arm, his love endures forever. To him who divided the red seed asunder, his love endures forever. 
and brought Israel through the midst of it. His love endures forever. And think about that first. God brought Israel through that. What you're going through right now, he's going to bring you through it also. His love endures forever. And he, but he swept Pharaoh in his, in his army into the Red Sea. His love endures forever. God's redemption doesn't stop in the Old Testament. The New Testament proclaims that through Jesus, we have been redeemed from our slavery to sin and death. And you'll find that in Romans 6, 17 and 18. And the third part of this psalm is the verses 23 through 25. God is our provider. He loves us by providing our daily bread, both physically and spiritually. He remembered us in our lowest state. His love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies. His love endures forever. He gives food to every creature. His love endures forever. So as we come today, we're here to worship you, God. We're going to praise him. We're going to sing to him. And we're going to thank him for his enduring love. His love endures forever. So when you leave this place today and go home and you have time for the week until we meet again, remember that you're loved by God. He created you, he redeemed you, and he continually provides for you. So let's have a word of prayer. Oh, Father God, thank you. We thank you that you are our creator, you are our redeemer, and you are our provider, and your love endures forever. Sometimes we forget when things get very challenging for us, Lord, but you're there, your love is faithful, and it never, you never leave us, and you're even beyond our understanding, you're there for us. So Jesus, we thank you. Let us be remembering each and every day, your love endures forever. And it is in your name, prepare our hearts to receive all that you have for us today as we come and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. I would turn in the Bible to um, Matthew chapter 12, please. Let's just ask the Lord to bless his word today. Father, thank you for Jesus and thank you for your holy word by which you created the heavens and the earth. And I pray that it would recreate something inside each one of us today. Touch us each and bless us according to your purpose for our lives. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And I ask also, Lord, for ordering of thoughts and words here this morning that you would by your spirit, guide me along. <clears throat> we'll read from verse 1 to 21. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Haven't you read what Jesus said? Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and are yet innocent? I'll tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue 
and a man with a shriveled hand was there, looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored. It's just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. A large crowd followed him and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not stuff out till he has brought justice through victory, through to victory. In his names, the nations will put their hope. Now, this is an interesting story. And one thing to point out is background information here at this point is two things. Um, there are scholars and students of the scripture, teachers of biblical truth, who believe that this man was a plant. He was brought into the temple in order to put Jesus into a difficult situation. Not on not inconsistent with other ways that we have seen the, the Pharisees work. And what he did and how he responded enraged them. This story cross references to Luke chapter six and also to Mark chapter three. And it enraged them so much that they left, and in Mark chapter 3, verse 6, it says, At this, the Pharisees went out and began plotting with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. So the leaders of the, the religious leaders of the day went out and began to conspire with the government authorities of the day how they might kill Jesus. Jesus. It's important to keep that in mind in the time and the place in which we live going forward. The thing that brought me to this scripture is the prophecy that Jesus referred to in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. In Isaiah chapter 40 through 42, he talks about the coming Messiah. And through six, chapter 66, he talks about what the redemption of Israel and God's people looks like. And he says, here is my servant, in verse 18, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul delights. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. Justice with God. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. 
A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not extinguish till he leads justice to victory. In his name the nations will put their hope. When Jesus had healed this man, he did it by his word. There was no touching. There was no mud pack. There was no hem of his garment. He did it in this instance by the word of his mouth. The power of his word is enough to heal. And I find that very interesting in light of how the, the Messiah is being manifest here. He is not one who is going to quarrel. He is not going to get into the face of those who oppose him. He is not going to cry out in the streets in order to draw attention to himself. But rather, he withdrew from that place and large crowds followed him and he healed them all, and he warned them not to make him known. It was counterproductive for Jesus to seek his own in any way, shape, or form in this particular time. That's not why he came. The recognition would come as a result of what he did, and what he did, he did one-on-one -on -one with individuals, with people who were hurting. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not extinguish. A bruised reed, the shepherds, in order to keep themselves occupied and entertain themselves, they would take a reed, a plant, and they would strip it down and make it into a small wind instrument. And the reed, if you've ever played a clarinet or a saxophone, is the thing that you have to lick and you know it's the it's the it's the the thing that of part of the instrument that's not part of the instrument but it can deteriorate over time. And that's what would happen to reeds they would deteriorate over time, so they'd make these instruments, and then as, the, as it lost its effectiveness, as it lost its ability to do what it was intended, its intended purpose was, it would be crushed and thrown away. We're learning, he, he's teaching about the Messiah, he's saying, this is what the Messiah is to be. and a smoldering wick he will not extinguish. They took flax and fibers or cotton type fibers and they wove them tightly into a, an absorbent wick that they put in a lamp and dipped it in the oil and the oil would be porous, uh, go through the porous cotton fiber or flax and fiber and the oil would be permitted to burn on the end of the wick. And when that wick got worn down, or needed to be trimmed, needed to be adjusted. It would be done so it could continue to provide light and it wouldn't become smoky. <coughs> Which if you've ever had candles in the house or you know when you have something in the house that you're burning like that, a lantern or something, you know that the, um, the smoldering smoke is kind of offensive if there's too much of it. And that's what they would do, is they would either replace it or crush it. They will extinguish it because it's not useful anymore. This is not what the Messiah is about. Jesus said, I won't crush a bruised reed, and I will not snuff out a smoldering wick. In our lives, when what happens to us causes the crushing of our souls, he does not crush us worse. Who we are and what we are is the result of what has happened, our relationships, events, circumstances, situations in our life 
can be very crushing. And our souls get heavy with that crushing. And we can feel a lack of hope, a lack of purpose, a sense of hopelessness. It can be crushing. But Jesus did not come to crush us up and throw us away. No. He went away from that place and large crowds followed him and he healed them all and he said, don't go and advertise all this. I don't want everybody knowing that this is how it goes. Keep it to yourselves. It was personal, one-on-one, -on -one, the bruised reed and the smoldering wick. The smoldering wick sheds no light. When as a Christ, a child of Christ, we feel our light has grown dim. We feel that our purpose as a Christian and as a believer <coughs> is failing or not effective. We can heap judgment on ourselves, but that is not the, what the Messiah does. In one of the benedictions, may the love of God the Father and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. May the grace of the Messiah, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you in such a way that you understand that the love of the Father will not permit you to be crushed or snuffed out when you're down. No, he comes to us in that moment. And it doesn't define exactly what happens there because I believe it's one on one. It's very personal how my soul is crushed. How things that happen to me affect my life is completely different than you. What we go through, we go through and he walks side by side with us as a loving, caring, graceful, compassionate savior whose job is the recreation or the creation of himself within us as he ministers by his spirit to our souls. Bless his holy name for that. Have you ever felt like a bruised reed, useless or overwhelmed to the point that you just don't know how you're going to deal with it all? Have you ever been a smoldering wick where you just feel like you got nothing worth sharing? Where your light is, feels like it's going to go out? He does not snuff it out and he does not crush it and throw it away. There was a time when I was a little boy. I think I was probably about five or six years old thinking back on it. I didn't know, I didn't think of it at the time, but in my older years, I have come to understand something about what happened to me. Uh, my father, used to make wine, blackberry wine. He would go out and he would pick blackberries, lots and lots and lots of blackberries. And in the basement he had this wooden barrel, a wine barrel. And he would ferment the blackberries in that wine barrel 
And he was very proud of his wine and he looked forward to sharing it with his friends and neighbors. But that was in the basement and there were times when I would go down into the basement because it was where the tools were and my father was also very much a, a do-it-yourselfer extreme and he he had a huge project going on in the upstairs of our house in Ohio and his work was so exemplary he had a fluorescent light fixture in the ceiling that was in the shape of a star he built cabinets into the walls it was a big long room if I remember and my brother and I lived up there when we were kids and it was just it got he got his picture in the paper he got the room in the paper in the picture but he did it all with it by himself it was beautiful and I wanted to be like my dad and so one day I was playing in the basement and I took some pieces of wood and I found a hammer and nails and I was looking around and seeing how I could make something and I ended up taking two pieces of wood and laying them on top of, guess what? Yeah. And I nailed right through the top of that wine barrel because I wanted to do what my dad did and I wanted to be like my dad. Well, praise God, I don't think I ever became like my dad in that capacity that expressed itself that, that evening when he came home. He was angry, and he hurt me. He called me stupid, useless, dumb. Words that in the soul of a five- or a six-year-old boy took deep root. Somehow I didn't even realize at the time what had happened or how that had affected me. But my, I certainly was a bruised reed. And I look at, as I have examined my life and realize who I am and what I am and under, come to an understanding of what makes Tony Macek Tony Macek, that certainly had to be a part of it, expressing itself in my lack of self-confidence and self-assurance. And understanding what that did to my soul. But Jesus, since he has come into my life, and I have committed myself to him, his watch care over me, is somehow in the process of restoring that damaged soul, that bruised reed, that smoldering wick. And each one of us has something perhaps not that extreme or heavy. But each one of us has something that we can find out about ourselves and understand how that took place. And I go back to the healing that is evident here with Jesus. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man responded to his word and he let it happened in his obedience to the word of Jesus. Stretch out that hand. Whether it was withered from birth, and there are other scholars who believe that this man may have been a mason, and his hand might have gotten crushed, and so he could no longer do his brickwork and his mortar work without two good hands. And that may have been why he was at the synagogue to beg for alms. And that's why it makes sense that he was brought into the temple rather than being in the temple because those who begged for alms did not do so. They did it outside of the temple in a certain marked area. Or excuse me, the synagogue, not the temple. Stretch out your hand. And he obeyed and he was healed. It is the living word of God which heals our souls as it conforms and transforms us into the image of his son 
The healing takes place as something over which we have no control. The only control we have is to listen to what Jesus says and obey, to do what the word tells us to do. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Every day when the, the Hebrews were in the desert, God provided them with manna. Every day it was fresh, every morning, and it was what they needed for that day. And there are days when I neglect my manna. There are days when I neglect the bread of life in the morning and I start out hungry spiritually. And perhaps it's the words of my father. They don't come back to my mind, but it's the effect. It's the crushing of my reed, smoldering of my wick. Only Jesus will let it shine brighter. Only Jesus will bring strength back to that crushed, useless, only good to be thrown away, bruised reed. I give thanks to him that it is him I put my faith and my trust to work these things out within me according to his pleasure. And I know from personal experience the more that I lift that up to him and confess it and acknowledge it and tell him I want it to be different that it becomes so. I partner with him and the power of his word in my humility before him as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are, what you have done, and what you are doing. And now, my friends and brothers and sisters, I pray that the love of God the Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit might be yours in abundance, realizing that every day his mercies are new, fresh, and available. Seek him with all your heart, for he rewards those who diligently seek him. In his name I pray. And all God's people said, amen.